You know, the last big thing that occurs to me, and it's it's a huge thing actually, is uh, the role of and the way to do feedback effectively. Uh, in, in the theater especially, uh, actors are getting feedback constantly. Uh, you know, if you're in rehearsal, your director is giving you feedback in the form of notes or comments or whatever, just constantly. And you can't be defensive about that. Welcome to the New World Podcast, where we delve into the ever-changing and accelerating pace of global change and its impact on our lives. I'm your host, John Paul Flores, broadcasting live from the New World Studio. Today, we're diving into the world of AI and automation. As an enthusiast and expert in lead generation, I will guide you through understanding and leveraging these technologies for your business and for your personal use. And don't forget, AI and automation might be unstoppable forces, but that doesn't mean you are powerless. Tune in to learn how to make them work for you and not the other way around. But first, let's meet our guest. Welcome to the New World Podcast, where we host and we navigate the changing world around us. I am your host, John Paul Flores, specializing in lead generation and AI automation, here to help you understand how our world is changing and what it means for you. And today, we have a special guest joining us, someone who brings a wealth of experience and expertise to the table. He's a visionary leader in the field of leadership development with a passion for helping individuals become their authentic best. Thank you, John. Please it's great to be here. Thank you for having to me. to Tom Hughes. Tom, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Awesome. Well, I do have a lot of amazing questions on the line, but before we go on the in-depth questions, uh, can you okay, give us well, a quick intro uh, on who As you who said, my name is Tom, Tom Hughes. Hughes. I live in the state What's of Utah, just south of Park City, Utah. What's your expertise, your experiences, and what keeps um, you busy these my days? Early, to maybe a, just quick overview history. I have an undergraduate degree in English from Harvard. I have an, M an MFA in acting also from Harvard. Uh, I have a master's degree in organizational psychology from Columbia. Uh, I've had the good fortune to live all over the United States and in Germany. And I've worked on six continents. I think I'm up to 31 countries now. I've been married 30 years. I have three adult children. And um, I have a career in organizational psychology, consulting, training, OD work, all those kind of related fields. Mostly That's flying awesome. in for the and work and flying home. And when you said you worked in six continents, where did you live there for some time or did you visit for the work? Uh, yeah, wow. Um, Favorite. And how are your experiences uh, So I'm a big fan of a lot places. of European cities and countries. Like I said, favorite. I lived in Germany, so I definitely have a strong affinity for Germany. Uh, really have enjoyed working in almost every country in Western Europe and, and a few countries in Eastern Europe. Um, wow. Had some fun adventures working in Mexico, uh, combining work with holidays, vacations, um, in fact, that's been true all over Latin America, so that's uh, that's been really fun and fortunate. Uh, I'm lucky that in my job I get to travel so much, which means I get to take my wife with me on, on a lot of trips these days now that our kids are grown. So uh, that's been fun seeing the world together a little bit. I wish I could spend or I had I wish I had spent or hope I will still spend more time in Asia and Africa, uh, you know, spent less time there and would certainly love to to see that so if anybody's out there and you need some some help and if you happen to be in asia or africa let me know uh sure i mean i i should say before i start that that's if awesome you look and can you share I, with I us your journey have and how it plan. led like this to was you not where a you are currently in your looking profession. backwards on it now the steps seem logical and I can see how it made sense that I ended up here, but it was by no means some sort of plan I set out to accomplish. 
Uh, after I graduated from college, I went to New York City to start my acting career. And I got a little work, but mostly I just ended up doing a day job. So I thought if I want to do this, if I want to be serious about this career, uh, I think it'll help to go to drama school. So I went back to Cambridge. I was fortunate enough to get into that program there at the American Repertory Theater at Harvard, uh, which is a two-year program. Uh, had a great experience there. During my time there, I got married. And so uh, when I graduated, my new wife and I moved back to New York City. Uh, had more fortune and more luck, had a good agent and all and so forth when I was in New York that time. But when our first child was born, uh, my wife and I decided that we just wanted to make a change. And so um, I had a good friend who was teaching at Columbia, and he suggested I uh, investigate his program at uh, at that university, a guy named Keith Allred. And, and I, in, upon investigation, that seemed like a really good idea. So, Seems silly to say, but a lot of my best friends are psychologists, and so uh, I, I ended up going into that program with the assumption being that I would go directly into organization development consulting, but because of my pretty screwy uh, career and work background, it uh, didn't end up that way, and I ended up uh, really needing to find a job at that point, so I went back to another old friend, a guy named Mark Nevins, um, who said, hey, I, I run a training team. Maybe you'd like to meet my team. And, and that you know, took a while, took several months. But end, I ended up then going to be a, in the corporate university at uh, Booz Allen Hamilton, a big consulting firm. And I spent five years there training consulting, consultants, and I learned uh, just a huge amount in those five years. Uh, after that, I went out on my own for a little while. Uh, then I was just sitting at my desk one day, and I got a call from another old friend, a woman named Lisa Wardle, who I had gone to graduate school with. And uh, she told me that she was interviewing at Duke Corporate Education, which is a company based in North Carolina. And uh, she said she'd given them my name, and I should talk to them. And so uh, that was April. And this one moved really fast. So I had a first conversation with them in April of that year. And by July, I was living in North Carolina with my family. Uh, I spent seven years at Duke, uh, four of those in North Carolina, three in Southern California, where they also had, I think, still have an office. And then I went out on my own again in 2013. So I've been uh, on my own now for a long time. Um, during Good COVID, year. one of my old colleagues from Duke, who was Good also year. on his own, um, he and I had been you know, just catching up during COVID, as a lot of us were doing, since we had a lot of time to catch up. And decided maybe we could do this thing better together. And so a few years ago now, we created what we call Appian Leadership. And this is, uh, we've just hit our fourth anniversary for Appian. And so uh, that's been great fun. And I, you know, great colleagues, great clients, and having a good time. Uh, yes, uh, some of it That's is amazing. the obvious stuff and, and some of it is the, the less obvious stuff. I can see why you have a lot of endorsements um, on LinkedIn. It's kind of funny. That and based on when that, I, I want to ask, the first does time, your so experience in, in theater still play a role started in what you do now? kind of outlining a book on this topic, and I still, although I still keep updating my notes, I've never gotten around to writing it, so maybe this will give me a little kick in the pants I need to get started. But, uh, yeah, I, in general, I would say there are two ways that the theater background has helped in my career. One of them is obviously in the way I do yeah. my work. So there's some really obvious things like the presentation skills side of stuff, which is, of course, that's helpful. Um, one of the things people don't typically understand about acting is that uh, your ability to listen has a lot more to do than your ability, more to do with a great performance than your simple ability to deliver a line that sounds realistic. Um, because every performance is at least a little bit different, and the people around you are changing what they're doing. And if you're not paying attention, if you're not listening, no matter what you do, no matter how elegant or graceful it might be in isolation, it won't sound like it's in sync or if it's a, a genuine response to what other people are doing. And so yeah. listening is a, a really important skill in the theater, and uh, that that one is still, you know, very, very important. I think... I think I'm better than most at hearing what my clients are saying 
whether that's in a, just a meeting or in a formal training setting or something, and and adapting uh, the conversation to where they are, whether that's to address a a spoken or unspoken need or a challenge, or in response to a spoken or unspoken hope and an aspiration. Um, I think another big benefit to a theater background is understanding that that every great experience you have in a theater is the product of of a team. Even if it's a one person show and there's only one person on that stage, uh, there were a lot of people that made that moment happen. And the same thing's true in the world of consulting and speaking and training that this is not just something you do in isolation. It takes a team. And so that's been really valuable. Uh, the, you know, the last big thing that occurs to me, and it's it's a huge thing actually, is uh, the role of and the way to do feedback effectively. Uh, in in the theater, especially, uh, actors are getting feedback constantly. Uh, you know, if you're in rehearsal, your director is giving you feedback in the form of notes or comments or whatever, just constantly, and you can't be defensive about that. And and you learn if you start off defensive, you hopefully get over it because what you have to learn learn eventually is that the director and the actor have the same goal, which is for the actor to look good, to do better, et cetera. Because when the actor does a good job, it reflects well on the director. The director's never, at least intentionally, going to ask you to do something that will make you worse. And I think, in general, people in organizations outside of the theater don't don't, uh, manage feedback as well as people in the theater do it. Uh, so I could go on and on, but I'll, I'll let it go. Uh, so if, if, if the first broad way it's affected my career is the way I do my own work and the way I conduct myself, then obviously it's had all the same impacts on what I'm teaching uh, other leaders, what I'm consulting on, what I'm advising them on, because all of that is also great content for other leaders to be educated on. So, um, yeah, I'd say that's how theater is continuing to impact my work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Teams and individuals. That's amazing. And in terms okay. of having I hope an that's audience, true. I'd, I'd I like think to you that's true. also coach massive amounts of people. So teams. That's that's right. That is that correct? Yeah. And I think, and I think on that part, on your background in theater, you're great at making sure that the audience. It's yeah, always engaged, I think, and that's amazing. I think about this. Well, I've been thinking about it a lot recently. And um, and I see that you also have I think one been of my in your big takeaways involved is that, design, education, um, consulting, because I, speaking, and writing. I have a that's friend who calls way, herself a, a practice. And how do you think your experience label, in these different roles shape your current uh, approach to leadership? Finding the meeting place of practice, practice and, and, uh, and academics or and for me, I think a little bit more about blending theory and practice. Uh, you know, there's this old expression that uh, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. Uh, by the way, you have, you, a lot of you, if anybody's watching me, uh, you may have seen this attributed to people like Einstein. Turns out, as painful as it is for me as a Harvard person to say, uh, it seems that it actually came from a, a student at Yale in 1882 named Benjamin Brewster. So don't give Einstein credit for Benjamin's work anymore. Um, but I think it's a really important idea that uh, that theory or principles, if you prefer, need to shape the practice of leadership. But practice should also be refining theory all the time. Uh, having a ton of experience as a leader doesn't actually make you a great leader by itself. Uh, leaders do bad, unproductive, unhelpful stuff for decades sometimes without getting caught. And we sort of think, well, they've been at it for a long time. They must be great at it. I mean, that's just not always true. It can be true, but it's not always. Um, and almost any leader, no matter how long they've been at the job, would benefit from some new principles or some new theories that help them understand what they do a little bit. On the other hand, it's at least very difficult, maybe impossible, to just formulate a theory on paper 
that actually anticipates and addresses all the issues and all the realities that leaders encounter every day. Um, uh, I, I had the good fortune to know Clayton Christensen, who was famous for the book um, uh, Innovator's Dilemma. Yeah, he's in, he, this is the guy who invented the theory of disruptive innovation. Um, and I was, I was visiting with him a few years after I was out of school, and, and he gave me an article he'd written, which was basically describing the role of a business school professor or someone who researches the world of management uh, and leadership. Uh, he said that the role of that person is to help the working manager or the working leader develop a set of what he called if-then propositions, meaning if these circumstances are happening, then I should do this. And that the goal of a leader over the course of a career is to build a, a, a continuing, continuingly expanding library of if-then propositions and ever more nuanced if-then propositions. Because what might work in one situation might be a disaster in a situation that looks mostly the same, but has even just one significant different variable. So I, I thought that was a, a, another great insight from Clayton Christensen. And that's essentially what I'm trying to do with my work is expand my own set of if-then propositions where I'm working with leaders and then to share that collective wisdom with, you know, I, I see between hundreds and thousands of leaders every year. And so if I can help uh, broadcast some of those if then propositions to people, then I think, I hope that's, uh, I hope that's worth doing. Absolutely. Yeah. That's amazing. And I do love the fact that you said uh, you need theory and you need practice. And theory makes practice and practice refines theory. Just like the books like Robert Cialdini's uh, Persuasion. Uh, you see it every day. Uh, they have theories, they test it out. And the results of those theories makes the theories even better. And yeah, that's why I love business books. Makes everything better. <laughs> uh, or you bring them in and let them do an audition for you, where they don't, uh, where the stakes uh, are. Well, the stakes are a little different. Um, if you can't, if you can't do a formal audition or like a structural audition where you have to actually see them perform, then. You know, there's a ton of research out there, and be, it, you could just easily Google the idea of a, um, um, oh, what's the term, um, a behavioral interview. But give them scenarios. Don't just ask them questions like, you know, what keeps you up at night? What are your greatest <laughs> strikes? What's your greatest weakness? Like, put them in a scenario and ask them how they respond to it. Uh, so that's for more experienced people. I think for younger people who where it's unfair to expect them to have any direct experience. Oh man, it's so every five minutes. That's pretty funny. That's five minutes on the dots. It's actually every five minutes. <laughs> but, um, so for for junior people, young people, where it would be unfair for them, for you to expect them to have real world experience, I I want to hire for traits. I want to for enthusiasm. I want to hire for hard work. I want to hire for creativity. I want to hire for uh, their willingness to jump in. Uh, I want to hire for people who don't spend their lives complaining. You know, and so I, I look, well, I, I'm not going to, that. I'm going to stay away from the whole argument about generations and blah, blah, blah. But because, you know, we all know a lot of senior people who are whiners as well. I want people who are not going to, I want people, I do want people who are going to bring up challenges and problems like race. I want to hear about, but I also don't want those people coming in and just whining and expecting me to solve everything for them. So you often hear people say, 
don't bring me a problem, bring me a solution. Well, okay, I think that's also a little bit unfair. If they don't know how to find a solution, I'd at least like to know what the problem is. But then I want someone who's excited to help fix it. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to hire for people who have a willingness to speak up, uh, who are willing to give me feedback, who are willing and capable of yeah. taking feedback. And I'm, I'm listing off sort of my wish list, right? Like the dream employee. There aren't any dream employees out there. These are the things you're looking for. And then you, you take the best that you can find, knowing that these are the things that are important to you. Um, and honestly, I'm a little torn. When I get, obviously, if I get two people who I believe are equally good on the content of the job, then I'm definitely going to hire for more motivation, more enthusiasm, more of those other things I just talked about. Sure. You know, but if I've got one person who's a little higher on, and a, virtually a little higher on the other stuff, I think I might even go for the other stuff. Because I think skills can be taught. I yeah. think some of that other stuff, well, it can be taught, but it's hard. Yeah. I mean, if they are pretty skillful at what they do, but they have a bad attitude, they probably have pigs already. And it's hard to teach them new skills. Well, it's... You know, I just, especially for a small company, is that really what you are? I mean, you're going to spend a lot of time with that person and they're going to have a very big presence in your team. Is, is that who you want to work with? Maybe not. And, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't want, I'm scared for the future, especially if I have to hire from my own generation. <laughs> <laughs> well... Listen, I will, I will say there's a lot of talk going on about generations and some of the research is good and some of it is bad. And unfortunately, a lot of the bad research is getting a lot of attention. Um, I'll tell you what I told my kids who are entering the workforce in their 20s now, and that is your number one, obviously the number one thing is you got to get good at whatever you're doing. But man, show up. Work hard. Be positive. Bring you know, bring your best to work. Be your authentic best. And and don't be needy. Now, there's nothing wrong with asking for feedback. And this is something I remind managers about all the time. People might it. The first thing I say is if you don't like the people that you have to hire now, that's because you and I as parents raised the wrong kinds of kids. <laughs> Those are our kids we're talking about, right? So if you got to do, if you don't like it, it's too, too bad. You created. So, second thing is, when you were twenty, you wanted a lot of feedback too, but you were afraid to ask. For it. They're just not afraid to ask. For it. They don't. What they want is not a reason. When you were twenty, twenty-five, whatever, you wanted to succeed quickly and and grow rapidly and be promoted when as soon as you were ready. That's not new. But they're willing to ask for, which you and I. On the dots, again, five minutes. One hour, five minutes. No, in the past, it's better. Just with, with, with. You know, I, I think uh, the, those, especially on the generation side of things, most of the managers grew up, I don't know if I'm correct, on when the industrial evolution is in place or is just finishing up. So I guess more of them are used to the more static ways of work. Uh, the person who asked the least question, who just put this thing on there, uh, so many times as possible, is the most productive, but they forgot to adapt. I could be. I could be. That's a really interesting way of thinking about it. And uh, what are the most common pitfalls of people who are new leaders, especially when they're hiring or when they enter a new team? I This is one of the things I say to new leaders all the time. You did not change jobs. You changed careers. So 
I've worked with people in all kinds of fields. If you were a, I don't know, if you were a bench scientist at a pharmaceutical company and you went from working on compounds to leading a team of scientists, you are no longer being paid for your competence as a chemist. Yeah. You are being paid to help other chemists do their best work. If you are, uh, if you work on, if you worked on an oil rig, and you got moved from, you know, your lounge to the shift supervisor, you are no longer being paid to turn cranks, spin wheels, and and manage the the operations. That that you're not you're no longer being paid to put your hands on the rig and make it work. You're being paid to get other people to do the right things at the right time. And that is a massive, massive mental shift. And it's especially, it's especially important in the first switch frontline to management, but it happens at every level along the way. There is always a sort of gravitational pull back to your last job. And if you've been promoted out of that job, that means you were good enough at it to be promoted. And so what that means is I left something I know I'm good at to do something I don't know I'm good at. And so your psychology, your skill sets, uh, your insecurities, everything about you is pulling you back towards your last job. And if you, that, that gravity will win. It will suck you back. So number one piece of advice for new leaders let go of the last job. You've got to do that. You know, that's very interesting. And I think it's counterintuitive to what most people teach. When you become a higher position in your company, especially if, if you're, let's say you are the best salesman, then you become a sales manager. You don't get more control. Maybe you get more control on people, but you get less control on things so i think they you know they forget to actually transition on that sometimes they just say yeah you do you're doing it wrong i used to do this like this that uh, it works and yeah you're doing it wrong don't do that and they forgot to realize that i'm not that guy anymore i need to be a leader <laughs> well and you know being a leader can some mean teaching or correcting oh, I mean, that's that's fair but what the I mean, to use your example, what that sales, what that former salesperson and new sales manager is not being paid to do, they're not being paid to go sell. <laughs> the salespeople sell. The sales manager makes better salespeople. Oh, I guess that's and, where the term micromanaging comes from. They don't want to let go of that position. That's why they try to always serve it back to it. Sometimes that's true. Yeah, that can definitely lead to micromanagement. Yeah. And because there are a lot of ways to be a good salesperson, right? Uh, and not everybody has to do it the same way. If I, but if I spend my life as a sales manager trying to get everybody to be the kind of salesperson I was, you know, then I might have some troubles. That's fantastic. And uh, let's go on attracting Oh man, on the dot. <laughs> on the dot. Uh, yeah, for people who are trying to attract the top talents, let's say they don't want people who is not experienced, they want the best immediately how can they do that even if let's say these people especially the top performers they often have a ton of offers coming in for them how can they differentiate to themselves and they say hey we might not be the biggest company but we might treat you better or something well i think for small companies solopreneurs etc um you've you've got to look first of all you might just not be able to get the highest performers. You just might not be able to offer them what they're looking for. Uh, because you just don't have the infrastructure, you don't have the reach, you don't have the markets. You don't, like There are a lot of reasons you might not be able to get them. 
But in, in terms of the question of how do I get the best people I can get, use that magic words already. You're going to have to differentiate somehow. You're going to have to be able to offer something of value to those people. So there are always going to be a certain number of people who would prefer to work in a startup than in a big established company because they have more freedom. They can, they feel like they can contribute more. They can contribute in many ways instead of just having one specific role. Uh, so there are some things about a startup that are unique and valuable and attractive to the right people. Um, and then once you've narrowed that pool down to people who are potentially interested in a startup environment or a small business environment or a solopreneur environment, then you start to, then I think you go back to the question of who, what kinds of people do I want here? It, you know, other than they like this sort of environment, other be what other patterns, what other, uh, you know, what, who do I enjoy working with and what do we need to accomplish in this and then you start to say, then you ask yourself questions like, well, how will I recognize those people? How will I know that when I see them? And you're right back into the conversation we had before about either auditioning them or the behavioral interview or whatever. That's fantastic. And let's go to books. Uh, what type of oh. leadership books can you recommend? But we have one rule. They cannot be the books that you always see on the shelves. They can't be the mainstream books or the top-selling books. We want the books that actually works. Maybe they're not as famous. You know, I'm losing you, so I, I have I, I I heard bits and pieces of the question. Ah, uh, yeah. So basically, what are the books that you could recommend for leaders? And one rule for this is it cannot be the most famous books because most of them are famous right. because of their authors. Let's go with the practicability right. and what works actually. Okay. The first book you should buy is my book. Uh, um, okay. Uh, let me, let me uh, answer that in terms of books that have influenced me. How's that? Uh, because again, going back to the something we've been talking about, not every book is going to be valuable to everybody. And and I'm also a big believer, you don't need to read a book cover to cover to find all of its value or to find its main value. I actually think, <laughs> in a funny way, a lot of books are like you can get a lot just out of the titles of a lot of books. Huh. Like someone gifted me a copy of The One Thing a couple of years ago. And I'd heard about it. I've, you know, seen some kind of online sprees and that sort of thing. But you know what? To me, I'm sure there's a ton more value. I just haven't got a reading. And I'm, a sh I'm confident there are tons of specific ideas in there that would be useful. Which was a great reminder to me of like, oh, what's the value of being completely focused on one thing? Ah, that's interesting. Okay, I need to consider that. Now, I'll be, I'll, I haven't read it, so I haven't given the author a shot yet. I'm not sure I believe in that principle. I don't know if you. When I system, uh, when I yeah, so the one big thing. Yeah, so you know, I'm not sure if I'm. When I read it, maybe the author will persuade me that they're right, but I'm not sure I believe that life can or should be all about. The one thing, but it's a really interesting idea. You know, am I overstressed? Am I trying to do too many things? Am I, am I spread out too much? Really important question to ask myself. Uh, I'm a big believer, and maybe this has got more to do with my, the nature of my business, but I think if you want to be a better leader, 
you should read really, really widely. And I don't mean widely within the realm of business books. I mean widely in the world of books. Read novels. There are reasons that we have stories around plays, novels, histories. There are reasons that some books have lasted for hundreds of years. And it's not just because they're easy to read, because a lot of them aren't. Yeah, there's just, somebody. There's 600,000 well, pages. But you know what? They don't have to be. They don't have to be. Read Beowulf sometime. It's one of the oldest stories we have in the more or less. And it's a beautiful old story about a king who goes out defeats monsters. But it's but it's also way, way more than that. Because you see the young Beowulf, the starting out warrior, who uh, has to go toe to toe with some really tough creatures. And not only like wins in the end, but he something about his quote unquote enemy. Um, and it follows him right up to the end of his life, where now he's an old king and he's he's won a lot of battles, but he's not a twenty five year old anymore. He's an old man, and an old man doesn't fight the way a young man fights, and. In some ways, he's way worse, and he knows it. He's not as strong, he's not as fast, he's not as agile, but he's way wiser. And he still wins, but it, it's a different kind of victory. Uh, so that's a, that's a leadership book. It's also just a really ancient, fascinating, and, and I think beautiful story. Uh, so, you know, I mean, think, one of the things I'm always impressed with is how many Nobel laureates in the science of this sense are incredibly well-read in poetry or are incredible musicians? Uh, and they, you hear them speak and they talk about their, the poets they love and the musicians they listen to. And you think, there's a, I don't think that's just an accident. I think there's something there. People who are really gifted at something I think part of their gift comes from knowing and understanding other things that they then bring back to the work they do. So, you know, you want to say books, go read, go, if you've been reading business books, go find a really great novel. Go read some Dickens, go read some, you know, Latte, go read some really good old classic stuff. Go read some Tony Morrison. If you want to get a new perspective, maybe go, I mean, there are, thousand great novelists out there. Pick one, I mean. Try. I think uh, they're less rigid in terms of when they're reading business books and there's this idea. They're more likely to oppose that idea because they gain in something else. But in novel, they can't do that because theoretically or on more uh, practical things, they don't know anything about it, but they get the principle of it. And from just what you said about the story of that Bill Wolf, I guess it's a great read because the old people who will read that will understand that, hey, maybe I need to trust this young guy because he has the energy that I used to have. And the young people can trust the older people because they have the wisdom that I have not yet got. It. I mean, I hadn't thought of that, but that makes perfect sense. Yeah, that's a perfectly good takeaway. I think the other thing is a really good novel or a good play or even these days a good Nuts. It's always on the dots. It's fascinating how it's always on time. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, whether you're you're reading novels or plays or watching movies or great TV shows or or reading biographies or, you know, whatever it might be. I think one of the things leaders benefit from is, is being exposed to other people's stories, other people's lives. And it, it built a sense of, it can, if, if we let it, it can build a deeper sense of empathy. It can build a deeper sense of 
being part of a community of how we affect each other. And I think that that makes a person not just a better leader. I think it makes them a better human being. Uh, sometimes you can be exposed, you know, in a, in a, in a world that is often very polarized and polarizing where people are very eager to argue with each other. Yeah. It's it when you're reading the, the story, there's nobody to argue with. You're just reading their story. And you could end up seeing something. You might say, oh, I hate this character. This person is terrible. Like, I, I disagree with everything they believe in. But they're there because they don't exist. But you get to look inside their head and look inside their heart a little bit and say, oh, actually, I kind of see where they're coming from. I don't, I don't have to agree with them. I still don't agree with them. But I can kind of see where they're coming from. I can sort of understand why they feel this way or why they behave this way. Huh. Become more compassionate. And when we... So much more. I mean, leadership is ultimately a human endeavor. It's one human being trying to help other people be as good as they can be. And... To... <laughs> what? There's, there's almost nothing more human than that. And so, you know, when people say, what is it, what's the best secret? What's your top secret for being a good leader? I say, be a good person. Come on. That's the... And, you know, this is the push that I needed to actually read the rest of the book that I have. Because I don't know if you see it. I have a lot of novels there. But I kind of argue yeah. myself out of reading them because they're too much, too long. So I have those, The Count of Monte Pisto, The Demons by Dostoevsky, <laughs> Brother Ramazov. Very scary and long titles, but yeah, I guess I'm going to read them more because of what you said. And, and if it's easier, you could get a shorter story. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. And as we near the end, because I do still have some questions, but most of them are already answered by the other questions. So I don't see it necessary to actually ask this uh tom again if you have any last words maybe uh what you can tell to people last pieces of advice that would be amazing oh gosh advice well i usually try to avoid giving too much advice but um yeah I've, <laughs> i'm sort of tempted to quote bill and ted's excellent adventure <laughs> it's an old movie from when I was young and uh, they just said be excellent to each other um, but you know I, I am going to go back There's, I believe uh, I don't know if this is advice but this is kind of I believe that everybody you know is trying to be better than they are today including you I think every one of us has a craving to be better and the way we get better is by experimenting, it's by trying things, it's by challenging ourselves enough to do it, like to actually make the effort to be better. And that, that means you've got to sometimes hold yourself accountable. But it also means you've got to be forgiving of yourself. And it also means you got to be forgiving of all those other people around you who are also experimenting and trying and just aren't fully successful yet how's that for a, a closing thought that's an amazing advice and you know yeah i guess the more compassionate the person is just basically flows to the other parts of his story or his family life you know it just makes him much better than that. being because he realizes that everybody around me is the same human being was just trying ah on the dot but <laughs> yeah, on the point, uh, the more compassionate the person is, the more likely they are to understand others and to understand oneself and to better it's oneself because they understand themselves. Perfect. And Tom, thank you for sharing your experiences and insights once again. Thank you. 
when can our listeners or anybody who's interested find you and your upcoming projects and initiatives? Uh, you're loading. All right. Did that give you everything you needed? You act your spin actually blacked out for the whole time. Oh. Yeah, so of where course, can people yeah. find you and what um, on project? Sure. Uh so you can find me and my team at uh, appianleadership.com, A P P I A N appianleadership.com. And you can reach me at Tom at appian.com. Awesome. And I'm going to have those links at the bottom so they can see it. And also, I'm going to have your links in the cover the screen so people can see it. And again, thank you for sharing your wealth cool. of knowledge and expertise and thank you. the importance of being compassionate and to actually explore other foods. And again, to connect with some, uh, discover more about this work, you can find him on LinkedIn and appianleadership.com. And he also dropped his email, so I'm at appianleadership.com, if I'm not mistaken. And bye for everyone. That's all for today's episode of the New World Podcast. We have explored some fascinating topics with our amazing guests, shedding light on the upcoming New World. If you enjoyed today's episode and today's discussion and want to stay updated on the future episodes, don't forget to hit that subscribe button to the podcast and if you found value on what we have discussed please consider leaving us a review on your favorite podcast platform remember if you have any questions or topics you'd like us to get to cover or if you are interested in being a guest in the future please feel free to reach out to me via linkedin or email me at john.paul at aicinix.com and add new world podcast all capital in the subject line so i can see it I always love hearing from our listeners. And don't forget to check out our amazing guests. You can find more information about them by the contact details we provided earlier. Again, thank you for tuning in on the New World Podcast. I know your time is very important and I try to always make the next episode better than the last. Until next time, keep learning, keep growing, keep innovating. This is John Paul Flores signing off from the New World Podcast.